The first lesson this morning is taken from Acts, second chapter. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. There were added that day about 3,000 souls. Speech of God. God the Father's crown came up. Glory to God. His hand. Yes, sir. Put all things under his feet. The epistle reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious body of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass in all its glory, like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Yeah, from grace, Hallelujah. Amen. Did not our hearts burn within while he talked to us on the road? The Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this? This conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk. And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Clophus answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And he and they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, 
mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. And now our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's towards the evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn? within us while he was talking to us on the road. Well, he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose at the same hour, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Please be seated for the sermon hymn. Jesus Christ is risen. Is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, you can't match that Pentecostal church that met here last night in their enthusiasm, but I hope it's a burning that they were two were talking about when they were going down the road that you feel when you say those words, Jesus Christ is risen. You see, he did. And because of it, all the promises of God have been given to us, we who believe in him. Now, I know that there are times when things are frustrating and especially if you're in pain or things aren't going right. Say you're homeless even. What can you do? Does Jesus really care? Does God care about me? Is this all a story or is this true? Well, let me assure you that it is in fact true. It is what took place and is what has been witnessed to by those people who wrote the scriptures initially that it would take place isaiah and jeremiah are full of it and the gospels matthew mark luke john and even luke's acts tells us about the risen christ and what he did and why he did it about 150 years, well, actually, working from zero, Christ lived um, about 4 B.C. is about when he was born, um, died in 30 A.D., uh, April, and uh, rose again from the dead. And... Uh, there were early church fathers who wrote about this and defended this. And they did well. And you heard the, the first reading today where Peter 
defending what took place and talking about the, the noise that brought all the people together and then the, the disciples going out and speaking to them in their own languages and how this wasn't because they'd gotten into some new wine, but because the Holy Spirit had moved them and they were speaking in tongues, tongues that they could be understood. And so these people were witness to, and he said, this is Christ, this is God, and you killed him. And it pierced their heart. They realized what they had done. Well, this early church father that I'm talking about, Irenaeus, he gave his life witnessing. Justin Martyr gave his life witnessing to it. In fact, he was so bold and wasn't afraid to die that he wrote a uh, defense for the Christians to Caesar and identified who he was and where he was and asked that the Christians get a fair hearing. And his rather pointed treaties was certainly given to them at the time. But, you know, if Christ died in, th uh, in 30 and Justin Martin died in 130 to one, somewhere around 130, 140, um, we're looking at 100 years. They say, well, that's a long time. Well, let's remember that St. John lived to about 103 AD. And uh, so that's not very far from Justin Martyr in that respect. And so the word concerning Jesus rising from the dead and the reason for him rising from the dead was certainly believed by those individuals who came in contact with Christ, who saw him. And the records that we get are very accurate. Um, I know that higher critics and um, some commentaries raised questions and one of the big things during the 18th 17th and 18th century going into the 19th century was great questions concerning whether and cynically saying this never happened because oh we can't duplicate it well right you can't duplicate it there's only one christ but the, all their foolishness leads nowhere and they have nothing to offer us. But as we read the scriptures and we see what they say, we have to be concerned that people sometimes twist them a little. One of the things that I was looking at is a statement that uh, what, what Christ was, we can be. Okay? And supposedly it was by one of the early church fathers. Uh, I've researched that a little bit and what it says if it put in its proper context is true true for every one of you and for me when Jesus Christ the second Adam came suffered and died for our sins he made it so we could be like he was a sinless man. You were created a man. You will never be a God. The, uh, the analogy, I guess, of the best thing I could give you for an analogy is the, the uh, ideas that people have concerning their pets. And um, the dog becomes part of the family. But you know what? The dog stays a dog. He doesn't change into a human being. We may think we can communicate with him. We can have, you know, a certain bond with him. And I certainly don't want to put that down at all, but he's still a dog. You were created a human being. You will be a human being. And heaven, the only thing that we know different about you being in heaven is you will not have your sex drive. You won't need it your joy and your uh, 
the population growth is, you know, that's it. Whatever takes place here on earth during our temporal life here on this earth is what takes place. And then when Christ returns, he takes all those who believe and trust in him to heaven to be part of God's family. Just like the dog is part of our, our family and we treat it well, that doesn't change who it is or what it is. But this is one of those twists to the Christian faith. At Jesus' time, you still had uh, Plato and Aristotle and uh, those individuals coming up with their philosophies. And that's Peter's point in his own letter. He says, that this isn't a philosophy. This isn't a, uh, something that we made up. This isn't a myth. And yet today, people would rather follow that because they don't want to be answerable to God for what they've done, but they're fooling themselves. But you know that Jesus Christ died for you and for your sins. How do you know that? Because he told you so. Because it's in his holy scripture. And in struggling with the, the gospels and the, the writings of the early church concerning that, when you look at it, 4% of the text, that's 0 0.04, has differences in it when we compare all the different text over 7,000 that, that have been written by people from Jesus' time on. I'm talking only the New Testament now. Now, of that 4%, only 4% of that has anything significant at all to deal with. So if you multiply that out, that's 0.0016. less than a tenth if we round it up it would be two tenths of one percent you can trust that scripture what it says is true and you know not one teaching is called into question by that point zero zero rounded up two percent of the text not one you have a pure scripture so that you can trust it. But not necessarily can you trust what man says about it because he can go off on his own tangent. And that's why you need to go back to the scripture and hold fast to it. You know, Jesus said, if you're faithful unto death, I'll give you the crown of life. Don't give up on Jesus because things became difficult. You were not promised a uh, Disney world. You were promised a uh, veil of tears. You live in a broken society. You see our world around us and the uh, people screaming that the, fall, the, the sky is falling. And Jesus tells us, don't be afraid. There is no need to fear. Now, you young people probably don't think about death until somebody dies or you see somebody dead. But as you get older, it becomes more, you know, the grass great challenge that we go through. And we we'll all will have to go through it unless the good Lord returns. Then we will skip out on that part. So I'm praying he will come soon. All right. But, uh, and I understand John when he says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But I can assure you, he's going to come in all our lifetimes. We will see him as he is, as he is as Lord and master, the gracious God who cares about you and loves you and knows you individually, knows your thoughts, your minds, what will take place and who continues to guard and protect you with his Holy Spirit. You need to be faithful. 
That's what we've been told by Christ. This isn't your pastor telling you. This is, is Christ telling you in his word. Be faithful unto death. And I'll give you a crown of life. Well, his gift to us is eternal life. Now, the song we just sang for the sermon tells you what he's up to from now until you see him. And when our loved ones die in Christ, they didn't really die. They just went on to be with the Lord. Their bodies will sleep in the ground until the resurrection. But they've gone to be with the Lord. It's not that they're suffering. In fact, I've, I've said before about how I had my heart stopped for about five seconds. Or so, and it wasn't painful. There was nothing there other than I think something's wrong. <laughs> and then you're gone. But you know, I've sat at many bedsides with people who have passed on. And the good Lord takes them and he blesses them. And it's not something to run from. Our Lord cares about us. He loves us. Everything that you read in scripture tells you about how he has cared for his I know my sheep, my sheep know me. We do not need to fear death. For we will receive a crown of life because of what Christ did for us. Now, as good Lutheran, I'm sure you heard that as a uh, megaphone in your ear, right? For what Christ did for us. Your salvation is independent on you. Your faithfulness is dependent on you. Well, sort of. Jesus will continue to call you back also. But he has done everything necessary for your salvation. So you can rejoice and rest a little easy. You don't have to be afraid about the COVID or any of the other stuff that you might have to suffer. Every day has enough problems in it in itself. Don't take on more problems of the people agitate about, oh, this is terrible. The world's going to end and they're going to be nuclear nuked here shortly from the Russians and we're going to nuke them. And Jesus said, worry about today. Deal with the problems of today. Tomorrow has enough problems of its own. We'll deal with it when we get there. Do what is right because it is right. Love because you have been loved. Forgive because you have been forgiven. Make life, your life count. Do that which will continue to bless others. Now that sounds like a lot of work, but really it's not. It's simply being what God created you to be. And he has done everything to bring you back to where you will be as a person without sin, completely acceptable in his sight. We have talked before about how God is holy and that his wrath breaks out against sin. It destroys it because if he would allow it to stay in his presence, he would be condoning it and it would destroy him. So it protects him. And what Jesus, our propitiation, that's what it really means. He's our umbrella. He's the one that keeps it from falling upon us. He's the one who's made it so that we can come into God's presence and not be destroyed, but loved and cared for. For God has feelings for us of love and mercy. Now, he's not looking for prideful people. Prideful people make themselves their own idols. He's looking for the humble person, the one who realizes who he is and why he needs help, and that he needs a savior. 
That would be you and me. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he died on a cross. And that's why he rose again from the dead. Pretty simple. It's what we confess in our creeds. It's what the church struggled with to be able to voice to those who were attacking it, who would try to bring in heresies into the church. They would copy a portion, but then would deviate, deviate because of their own great knowledge, their philosophy, rather than staying with the word of God. So, you have been catechized. You have been raised in the faith. You know that Jesus has died for you. Now, you know what I've said. But I'm sure the Holy Spirit has convinced you in your heart that you need a Savior and that he is your Savior. That you don't need to live in fear. You're a not going to be damned because he saved you. And that's why we celebrate a little Easter every Sunday. So Jesus Christ is risen. risen Hallelujah. You may not make Pentecostals, but you're getting there. <laughs> we continue with the offertory. of Christ, the offering is taken. You are encouraged to be part of that offering. 